Let's honor God for who He is tonight. And we may be tired, we may be worn out, we may have a day ahead of us. He still deserves everything that we can give Him tonight because He is honorable, He is perfect, He is holy. And He gave us another day, another breath, another heartbeat that we don't deserve. Brother Tim. Raise your hands in your voice tonight. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Lord, we thank and praise you for being here tonight, God. We thank and praise you because you woke us up this morning and started to sun away, God. Move in this house tonight, God. Move on the, everybody tonight, God, that's sick. Everybody, God, that's discouraged. Everybody depressed tonight, God. Heal, God. Move tonight. God, move on the teacher, God. Help us to receive your spirit, Lord. God, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory tonight, God. We ask that you move, God, in your name tonight, God. What's his name? Jesus! Come on, let's give glory to his name. I said let's give glory to his name. Come on, clap your hands and praise him. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Where for cleansing from sin I cried There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to his name Glory to his name Glory to his name There to my heart So sweetly abides within There at the cross where he took me in Glory to his name Glory to his name Glory to his name There to my heart was a Precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There, Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Tanto rich and sweet Cast thy poor soul At the Savior's feet Plunge in today And be made complete Glory to his name Glory to his name Glory to his name There to my heart Glory to his name, 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 glory to
desert. I have wandered through the valley. I have yet to find the spirit of refreshing. I have cried so many teardrops. I have yet to find relief. Lord, let your spirit fall fresh on me. sometimes in order for God to reign in my life I've got to let him reign as my king 
instead of letting him come second or third or, or maybe even fourth or fifth place in my life? Is he, is he what consumes me throughout the day? Is he what's on my mind? Is he what's in my heart? Or is it something else? Have I got something else reigning in my life? Reigning is my king uh, besides God. Um, you know, I need to look at that on a daily basis. Because in order for him to R-A-I in my life, I've got to let him reign as king in my life. I've got to put him first and foremost and give him the honor and, and what's due to him for what he done for me that he didn't have to do. Didn't have to do it. So I need to let him reign as my king. <clears throat> Roxanne, someone mentioned you singing tonight with your girls. You sing with your girls tonight?
Jesus Christ chasing us down you know as a sinner we're not out there looking for Jesus we're not out there looking for his blood we're not out there looking for the cross it's him who's chasing us down and we're not even looking for him we're looking for something else we're looking in pleasure and sin for a season or whatever the world can offer us but no Christ is right there behind us calling us begging us come to me come to me just like James said man when he died on the cross he had James on his mind he said, I'm doing this for Brother James Green. I'm doing this for James. I'm giving myself for him because I know he's going to need me. Because he can't do it on his own. Because Josh can't do it on his own. If you think you can earn your way into heaven by your righteousness, you're sorely mistaken. You're not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's not the good things that I can do that's going to get me there. Until that blood is applied to my life, I'm not going to make it. Until I accept Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I'm not going to make it. You know, and He paid it all for me. 
When I felt no worth, maybe you're on Facebook tonight. Maybe you don't feel like you're worth anything. Not worth anything. Maybe you feel like you're just the worst of the worst. Well, I tell you what. Jesus paid it for you. And if you'll take that blood and let it be applied, claim it upon your life, and what he done for you on the cross, then you're all of a sudden worth everything. You are a child's, you're a king, uh, uh, child's, excuse me, you're a uh, child of the king. You all of a sudden become a prince or a princess because you are that royal blood. Once that royal blood has been applied to you and all we have to do is claim it tonight. That's all we got to do. It's free for the offering. All we have to do is take it. Let's hear the word tonight. Let's give a pastor a hand. Man, that was some good preaching. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a great big hand clap of praise there. Amen. Uh, you can do better than that. Come on, somebody bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, our Savior. How many is glad to be in the house of God tonight? Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, I'm going to bless his holy name. Amen. I'm glad that you are here this Wednesday afternoon to bless the Lord, to lift him up, and to uh, indulge in the word of God. Amen. Uh, to dig deeper uh, into what he has for us. And uh, there's no better place to be than to do that than here. And so we're glad you're here. If you have your Bibles tonight, uh, we're going to go into the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, is where we're going to probably read at uh, for the majority of our Wednesday night teaching. Amen. And I can already see the benefits of what God is doing on Wednesday nights of what he did this past Sunday. Amen. I'm still feasting off of this past service. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. I went back and watched Facebook Live, and I was proud. Hallelujah. Yeah, we... We ain't ashamed to bless him and praise him and glorify him. Amen. And worship him. Hebrews chapter 9. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 1. The word of the Lord declares, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table of the shoe, and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, and the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of the glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we could not now speak particularly now when these things were thus ordained the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God but into the second went the high priest alone once every year not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the, t for the time then present, in which we offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to, to the conscious. Can someone say amen to the reading of the word of the Lord? If you would, please lay your Bible down and grab somebody by the hand. Let's go to God in prayer as we get ready to, to jump in and teach and have our minds enlightened by the revelation of God's word. Father God, we thank you. Praise the Lord for tonight. Thank you, God, for our gathering us here from every diff different walk of life, God. And even though we may be tired and and going through God right now I know that you're able to strengthen every single one of us by the power of your spirit God by the preaching of your word anoint me God tonight to teach and to preach as your spirit would lead me and guide me don't let me quench anything but let me flow into your spirit and your revelation as you seem fit for us to hear tonight in the mighty name of Jesus and God's with that believer says amen and amen come on clap them hands and give God glory hallelujah 
Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God, our Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. We are uh, dealing, this is part three so far of uh, the tabernacle, which we have many uh, more uh, parts to um, overlook. Uh, and so um, just to pick up a little bit where we left off last week, we talked about the pillars. We're talking about the outside of the tabernacle. And um, as we talk about the outside of the tabernacle, we're talking about the pillars that were made of, of brass. We're talking about the, the, the uh, ropes, the cords that held both pieces, one inside, one outside. And we also talked about the pins and uh, that would hold down uh, what we would call stakes in today's time. Remember, there were 60 in all. Uh, the material was brass for the pillars. Uh, then we got to their position. They were fastened down by cords, one outside, one to the inside. Talking about twofold cord working together in unity that holds up the structure of the tabernacle in itself. And then we get to the pins, and this is where we finished last week about the pins, or that we refer to them as stakes. It's something so minute as a pin or a stake is still significant uh, in uh, in our revelatory uh, searching of Scripture to see what it was, uh, how it affects our life. It was made of brass. It is what secured the cords that held up the pillars. Uh, and then the word pin in the Hebrew, it translates to nail. Somebody say nail. Say it again. Say nail. So when we look at this word nail, uh, when they nailed the pins, there was a few things that were happening here. This represents Jesus that holds all things in place. So Isaiah talks about Jesus being the nail. Uh, he's speaking prophetically that there would be a nail that everything would be put up on, and then one day the nail would be removed, and everything that would be there that was held would fall off. Go read that in Isaiah chapter 22, 15 through 25. That's talking about our sin. For the Bible says that our sin was nailed to his cross. So he took it on himself, nailed it to the cross, and then the nail was removed. And now we do not see a, a, a cross that has anything on it. We see an empty cross, all right? Uh, which means there's an empty tomb, amen? And we'll remember that. And so this is what we strive for, to be nailed or fastened and secure. I want to be secure. Can someone say amen? I want the power of revelation to be secure. Uh, I want to be uh, something that can be depended upon, and that somebody can put the weight of something on. And, and depending what size the nail depends on what size, uh, what you could do with the nail. A finished nail does not go into rough construction. Can someone say amen? The heavier the nail, the more you weight it can con control and hold and, and be strong. And so that's why God is working on us so he could put more on us. To where much is given, much is required. And so you can't say you want more of God and stay your weak self. And keep your old thinking and your old language. Come on, somebody. Does it work that way? Because God will not hang something on you that's going to fall off for you because it's heavy. Can someone say amen? So God has to strengthen us to get us to that place to where we can be secured. And so the pins were nailed into the ground. This is where we finished that last week. We, we did not see them. Uh, if y'all remember when we put up the, the gospel tent in Spruce Pine, you nail the stakes almost completely into the ground. They go all the way down in there because it gives them secure. Uh, the more of them you see, the less secure the tent itself is. And so the more, pe the more people see you, the less secure you are. If you have to be seen, oh, come on, somebody. And we've been, we've been around people like that that has to always be seen. I always has to be known. Now, everybody's got to see them. Being honest, they shouldn't be seeing you. The old man should die and be buried and be the new man by unity holding on the, the little bit of flesh. That's why the Bible says that, uh, that, uh, that uh, bodily exercise is profit if little. Now, it does profit. Okay, so, uh, so when people tell me that, well, that, that scripture right there tells you you shouldn't be praising God because it's all about bodily exercise. Well, that is not the case because it does profit. Can someone say amen? It does profit to worship and praise God. But people should not, when they look at us, they should see more of him, the cord that is connected to the pillar, than they should see of ourselves. And so, you know, when you, you find out what begins to happen is, is uh, the cares of life start pulling you out of the ground which then starts weakening the tabernacle in itself. And so sometimes you've got to come to church and be driven. 
down. Get your attitude down. Get your high mindedness down. Come on, somebody, help me now. Okay, am I talking? Has anybody ever come to church and thought, man, my God, the preacher just beat me on the head? Someone say amen. You know, he did beat me. I stomped on my toes. He beat me. Now. Because God sometimes is just trying to get us back down to where he can use us to continue to hold the structure of the tabernacle up. Can someone say amen? And so that's what Jesus did. When Jesus was buried, uh, he went down, uh, and the old man died and held us together, and the new man was risen in power uh, and, in, and in strength. So we must bury our old man and desires to held, hold up the tabernacle that God has established. So we're finishing with that. Just a little recap to go into uh, what I want to talk about uh, tonight. The brazen sockets. Okay, so we have... Uh, the outside, the dimensions of the outside of the court, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And in each uh, 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 pillar, there was a socket that it would sit in. So there would be, if there were 60 uh, brazen pillars, there were 60 brazen sockets. And so uh, the sockets were like the foundation. And so you would take the, the brazen pillar and you would have it in the socket. This is where the pillars set in. This was a very small part, but played a, a critical part in the tabernacle. And so this represents the parts of the church. And so I want us to go to the 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, and I want us to look at some scripture here that will uh, continue to um, let us know that we all have a part to play. Can someone say amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Reading is a little bit lengthy, but I want us, we're, we're here. We can, we can take as long as we need to. Uh, on our Wednesday nights, all right? For the Bible says this, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now listen to this. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Do you see where we're going? It's all about one. It's not about many. It's about one. All right? For the body is not one member, but many. All right? If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? My God, don't that sound like the church? I didn't get to sing my song, glory to God. He ain't asked me to sing on the praise team not one time. I could play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Hello, I'm just I'm joking. That's all right, you know. And get mad and upset. They didn't ask me to bring my potato salad to the dinner. You know, they, they didn't, they didn't, pastor didn't shake my hand. I'm not getting to do what I want to do. Well, the, the, but guess what? The, you may not, what you're wanting to do may not be what God has placed you to do in the body. The hand may want to be the foot, but guess what? It ain't. And, and, and I, I'll be honest. There's some churches you go to and you ask the preachers to stand up, and 75% of the people stand up call themselves to preach. The devil is a liar. Everybody wants a microphone. That's all they want. They want a microphone, and they think you get rich. Uh, yeah. And so they want to do all that. So, yeah, I'm a preacher, but they don't want to pray. And they don't want to fast. And they don't want to study. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm walking good right here. Guess what? That, they're not the part they want to be. And I believe we do sometimes people an injustice. You know, when I feel the anointing off of somebody for somebody to preach, I don't automatically tell them that. Because I want to see. Can someone say Amen. I want you to know where you fit in at, and you're not just fitting in uh, just because somebody can give a fired-up testimony don't mean they're called to preach. Oh, Jesus, I'm doing good tonight, and I'm making you good and mad. you got to find where you fit, and that's where you work it. Can someone say amen? Let's keep reading. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? It's still part of the body. It just ain't doing its part. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole were a hearing, where was the smelling? But now hath God set in the members, every one of them, in the body as he, it hath pleased him. Not you. God has put you in the body where he wants you. 
And so if you are where God wants you to be and he's pleased with you, it doesn't matter if anybody else is pleased with you and it doesn't matter if you're pleased with you. If he's pleased with you, then that's what matters. And that's what you've got to ask God tonight when I walk out of here. Am I pleasing where you want me? Am I doing my part at Greater Remnant? Am I doing my part in your whole body? Am I doing what I should be doing? Or am I upset because I'm not getting to do it? Let me, now, let me ask you, some of you now, some of you that have a position in this church, would you be coming here if you did not have that position? I'm, 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 I'm waiting. I'm just wanting you to see you for a minute. Sunday school teachers, if you was not a Sunday school teacher, would you be here if you was not a Sunday school teacher? Ooh, deacons, would you be here if you was not a deacon? Hello. I'm talking now. Praise and worship singers, musicians, would you be here if you was not getting to do your part? These are questions you have to ask yourself. Am I where I'm supposed to be? And if I am, am I doing it for the right reason? Okay? We're, you say, my God, that mean, then you're mean, Pastor. I'm glad. I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad. I'm just going to live up to the old reputation, I guess. Listen there. But now God has said, uh, uh, set the members of every one of them in the body as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where would the body? But now are they many members but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the, the, the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Let me tell you, I need you. And you need me. Look to your neighbor and say, I need you. Look behind you and tell you somebody in the next row, I need you. Look at somebody in front of you and say, I need you. We, 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 we need each other. We need, we need. Just because you don't sing don't mean I don't need you. Just because you don't preach don't mean I don't need you. Just because you don't teach don't mean I, I don't need you. Just because you're not on my board don't mean we, we need each other. And, and when we ever get to the point where we act like we don't need each other, I'm finding another church to pastor. Because as many people come in, we need you to be who God's called you to be and do what God's called you to do so we can accomplish everything that we need to accomplish. And you say, Amen. Shake somebody's hand and say, I need you. He said, Good teaching. Uh huh. I need you. Uh, and say, Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So look at that. The ones that seem to be more feeble, not as strong, they are necessary. I had to eat that myself. I get mad sometimes. Because I know people in here ain't doing what they should be doing out there. You better thank God I ain't God. <laughs> Bam! Out! Get done. Someone say, man, I'm out of here. And then when I read that, God said, hey, listen, just because they're feeble don't mean you don't need them. Just because they're not as strong as you don't mean you don't need them. My right hand is, strong, is, is, not, is stronger than my left hand. I'm not ambidextrous. My, but just because my left hand ain't stronger, do I cut it off? And so here we go with people in the church. Because some people don't do it the way you do it and don't like the way you like it. Then you want to cut them off. And there's a bunch of churches out there that's cut off part of their body. They don't want nothing to do with them. Guess what? When they get to heaven, they're going to be surprised. Because there's going to be some people there that's part of the body that they cut off down here and they realize, my God, I could have used them when I was down there. Yeah. Someone say amen. Can I keep reading? For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together. Tempered. Now, now you've got to understand that. That... Uh, We'll talk about that some other time. Having given more abundant honor to that part which lack, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Uh, and whether one member suffer, all members suffer. I know that's right. I tell you that. I'm in my own body today. I was putting some siding on my house, and, and my thumb got in the way. Oh, Jesus. I was doing some dancing, but it wasn't like Roxanne on Sunday. You know, I, I was throwing my hands up in the air. My uncle was helping me. He raised up and goes, I didn't feel it. I said, no, you didn't, but I did. 
I thought, Lord God, it, but my, my, man, my whole body hurt. It ricocheted through. I mean, my, I slammed my thumb. And everything hurt. Can someone say amen? So when you see somebody in this church hurting and it doesn't affect you, what's wrong? Something is wrong. Can someone say amen? When one hurts, we all should be hurt. We should, it should, it may, it, you know, I, my, my right thumb didn't hurt when I smashed my left on the day, but it still affected me because after that, I, I began to be a little skittish because I was still in pain. So my job became a little harder because I was what I was trying to nail together until the pain left, until I got it to work together. I wasn't moving at a faster rate. It affected everything about me. So when somebody in this church gets hurt and having to deal with things in life, guess what? If you don't think it don't affect you, you're wrong. It affects the services. It affects our meetings. It affects our revivals. It affects everything. Why? Because we are fitly together. But guess what? I started doctoring this, this thumb. And, uh, uh, you know, my mouth knew how to take an Advil. hi yeah, Glory to God. Can someone say amen? I took something to get rid of the pain. So I could continue to do my job. And so that's what's wrong with the church. We got people that when they start getting hurt, we just want to cut them off. What sense would it made after my thumb hurt, start, got hurt because it got in the way? And then go just cut it off. It ain't no good no more. <laughs> Timmy over here, I forgot about old brother Tim. Hallelujah. Yeah, he likes cutting his off with lawnmowers. He looked at that nah, ain't no good. <laughs> Let me read on. I, I'm, I'm meddling. We still need Timmy. Can someone say amen? I, mean, I thank God for Brother Tim. Can someone say amen? There's been times I'd like to knock him in the head because I know it. He don't listen to nothing I got to say. And then come to me later. Pastor, you was right. I told him, I said, I ain't wasting my good breath on you no more. I ain't, I ain't telling you nothing no more. Hallelujah. Verse 27, I'll finish. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And then he tells us here in Corinthians, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And then he asks to the question, are all apostles? No. He said, I said some. Are all prophets? No, I said some. Are all teachers? All workers of miracles have, have all the gifts of the healings. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet, uh, uh, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. He said, you don't have to be those parts. I'm showing you a better way that you still fit. I'm going to show you something. Uh, with the fivefold ministry, and what, what, I know I'm going a little long. If, if you look at it, remember, I don't know if you remember when, we did teaching, when I started teaching earlier uh, this year or maybe even late last year about the fivefold ministry and about how it's set up how we have the apostle we have the prophet we have the evangelist have the pastor and have the teacher okay we have those five hold your hand up like this wave at me it's the best way to remember apostle stands out different but the foundation without the thumb uh, no one can you cannot grip you cannot make a fist you need the apostle it is the foundation you have the prophet that points tells you your future this is what shall be. This is what is going to happen. You have the evangelist, the middle finger. It's the longest finger. It's the one that reaches. It's the one that grabs. One that grabs people in together. Then you have the, the, the ring finger, which is the pastor, which represents covenant. That's why you write your ring on that. And that's who you're in covenant with. That's who you, you work with. That's who you see. And someone say amen. Then you have the teacher, which is the smallest finger, but can get into places that no one, none of the other fingers can get into. So they all work together as the hand. And so you can see that when they come together, it raises a fist. And it continues to work together. Now here, I'm going to show you something. Uh, here in Corinthians, he says uh, that he set up in the church. Uh, the, the, can, can I read it? And God has set in the church first apostles, secondary prophets, the teachers. After that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, uh, and, and of uh, diversities of tongues. And then he asks his question, all apostles. And so here he sets some. In, in, in Paul's other writings, he talks about, he first sets the apostle. He, then he's, right here he sets the prophet. Can we read it again? And, and God has set some of the church first apostles, secondary prophets, and thirdly, teachers. So what sign does that make? I love you. For God is love. So he's showing us that he is all about love. And he loves us enough to set us up to where we can work 
together in one mind and one accord. And so this helps us work here. That makes us look as the brazen sockets here in back uh, in the going back to the tabernacle that every member has an important function. Okay, so I want to show you something about why I said that, why I started this, because the representation of the hole in the socket. So the socket here that held the brazen uh, uh, pillar up on the tabernacle, it's playing a very important part. There's three representations that this hole makes. All right, the first representation, I want you to think about a socket uh, that would be a, a hole that was brass that they would put the brazen, they would pick up the brazen um, pillars and set them in it. To where it could kind of set there to where they can run their stakes and their and then dr drive them in to where they could hold it up the first thing so there's a big hole there looks like it's empty looks like it's no good but there's a reason the first the first hole uh, it, the, the hole in the socket first represents the hole that the cross was placed in that raised Jesus up from the earth but when they went to uh, uh, when they went to put Jesus on the cross they'd already pre-dug a hole for the cross to be set in and then the dirt put back in to where it could be tampered and Jesus could hang there on the cross. Mm. For a moment, when the hole was being dug, the hole, if it had to had a moment, said, well, man, there ain't nothing in me no more. But something great was about to be put in the hole that would hold up Christ, which would hold us up for the rest of eternity. So when God starts emptying things out of you, you ought to get excited. I'm trying not to preach. I'm about to just run all over the building and preach the house down just for a few moments. And I may do it here in just a minute when you see where we're going. Can I keep talking? And, and so you sometimes got to let God dig out some things. You've got to become a socket that has to sometimes be an empty place. When you get into ministry, if you ever really want to be in the ministry, there'll be times you'll have to preach empty. You'll have to sing empty. You'll have to minister empty. You'll have to have nothing in there. So God can put in there what he wants to put in there. So they did not know it, but when God told them to make brazen sockets, it was a representation of the great pillar that, that we have built the church upon and it has held the power of the church on is the cross. Oh, Jesus. But you've got to be willing to be empty so God can fill you. Can I keep talking? So, so, but there is another representation of the brazen socket. The second hole represents the hole of the empty tomb. So the socket, when you seen the socket, and it did not have nothing in it, it was representation of the tomb that would be empty. I feel God in the place. Because they put him in, but three days later, he rose with all power in his hand. The tomb, that's why the cross does not have Christ on it. And, that, and the reason the cross don't have Christ on it is because the tomb don't have Christ in it. He has risen. He has ascended. He went down for three days until the hell and said got the keys of death hell in the grave led captivity captive and gave good gifts on the men I've come to tell you he's not there anymore he has risen he is not in the tomb the tomb is empty he went in but he did come out and I don't know about anybody else but I can say I'm glad that he got up he got up and then I can say oh death where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Somebody tonight ought to get up and tell death, you ain't going to make me afraid. Somebody ought to tell the grave, you ain't going to scare me because Christ has written. And Jesus says, if that same spirit that raised him from the dead, if it dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. Somebody give God 30 seconds of praise if you're glad that the tomb is empty. Does somebody say the tomb is empty? So here the hole has been dug for the cross to set in. Speaking of emptiness, mm, and now the tomb has now become empty after three days. Here's a trend. Can I give you the trend? Then this is what the third representation of this hole represents of the socket. Because the hole that put the Christ in, it was empty. The cross went in. The tomb was empty. But now, the third, the hole represents you becoming empty 
so that God can fill you with his power like he did on the day of Pentecost. Hit my tie, say I know the whole. But the Bible says they were in one place and one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And then what does it say? And it filled the house. That let me know something. There were some empty places in that house. There were some places that weren't full. There were some places that had nothing in it. But when the Holy Ghost came in, it filled the house. It's some of you come in here say, Preacher, I'm empty. Preacher, my marriage is empty. My ministry is empty. My life is empty. Everything in me feels empty. Don't worry, baby. You're in the right house. Because when the Holy Ghost comes in, He feels the emptiness. He takes care of the boy. And if there's anybody in this church that believe God is about to fill you up, about to put something inside of you, you ought to Give God 30 seconds of crazy praise and say, I know that God's going to fill it up. I know I feel depleted. I know I feel empty. But God is about to put something in me. Give somebody high five and say, He's going to fill you. 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 He's gonna, he's gonna fill you. He's going to feel you. When the socket was made, it was made to be empty. So when the time upon it to set up the tabernacle could come, that it would be specifically be able to hold the brazen pillar of the tabernacle. You would not, when they made it, they did not have to force in the brazen pillar. It would fit in its place. It fit because it was made to where it could hold the dimensions of the, t of the pillar itself. That's why God keeps wallering some of you out. Because when His anointing comes, it ain't going to be hard. It ain't going to take him five services to, to try to put something in you. So that's why that's why people have been leaving you. He's wallowing you out. That's why you can't listen to some of that old music. He's, he's wallowing you out. That, that, that's why you can't talk to certain people. He's wallowing. He's, he's, making, he's making the brace a socket. So when the, when, the, when the pillar sets into the socket, that it will fit without friction. Without and that's why sometimes God, when you, if you've ever been in the service and you felt the glory just about ready to come, it boom, it gone. It, 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 come on, be, be honest with me, be honest with me. I've been there. Even in here, I've been pastoring here in here in November, there's been some services that I've seen the glory of God like a cloud get ready to fall. And then gone. And I didn't understand until I started seeing this part right here is that we weren't empty enough. We was thinking about what we had to do at the house and what bills we had to pay. And when we had to go to work, I feel like preaching tonight. I know you ain't liking me, but, but we, we, had, we had everything else on our mind and we weren't wallowed out enough. And so God's like, I'm not going to force my way in. God will not force his way in. He'll either fit in or he won't come in. Uh -huh. I said he'll either fit in or he won't come in. I want God to come in. Does anybody want God to come in? Throw your hands up and say, come in, Lord. Come on in. Come on in, Lord. Come on in. God, get rid of me. God, you ought to pray. Come on right now. Pray. Say, God, whatever's causing your glory not to come in my life, get rid of it. God, whatever, if it's a bad attitude, if it's my language, if it's people I'm hanging with, if it's music I'm listening to, God, whatever it is that's keeping me from experiencing the pillar and the weight of your glory that wants to sit in my life, then God, get rid of it. Get rid, get rid of it. Make me a vessel that you could use. Make me a socket that you could use. Make me somebody that you can use, God. Make me. I want to be made. I want to lose everything I have to lose so I can gain Jesus. So the pillar can set in my life. Can somebody say amen? Now the socket, you got to see what the socket was at. The socket was on the bottom. It was not on the top. 
The socket's purpose was to hold the pillar. It was on the bottom. Real ministry. If you want to be real and carry real anointing, you will not be placed on top. But you will be put on the bottom. I feel like preaching tonight. Now I'm losing people. Those people are like, nah, I don't like the bottom preacher. I don't, but that's where the socket had to be. <laughs> it had to be placed on the bottom so that the pillar of Christ could set in it. And when people think about it, when you came here tonight, now now we have new do we have doors, our painting ministry. Sister Roxanne and Sister Cynthia come here yesterday and painted all of our doors. Come on, give them a great big hand clap. They're matching the roof that's going on the church. Now, I know when you pulled in and whatever door you came to, whatever door you saw, you probably, you should have seen that it was nice. Now, when you come in, you probably seen the door. You probably seen the new roof that's going on. But guess what? I bet nobody in here look at the foundation. Nobody looked at the foundation. <laughs> Nobody had any idea about the foundation. You've seen all the nice stuff that the foundation is setting upon, but you really didn't pay attention to the foundation. And if the foundation had feelings, it would get hurt. The foundation would be cried, but the foundation knows that without me, they wouldn't be seeing these doors. Without me, they may be overlooking me and they may walk all over me, but I'm playing a purpose. When you become a socket, you are not on top. You are what Christ gets put in and people look to Christ instead of look to you. That's why Paul said, it's Christ in me. That is the hope of God. I'm just a socket. Without the Christ that's in me, I am nothing. The socket on its own was nothing but a piece of brass that had a hole in it. But when the brazen pillar was put in it, then the socket had a purpose. And none of us would have a purpose if it wasn't for Jesus. None of us would have a purpose if it wasn't for the anointing. None of us would be here tonight. I'm glad to be in the number. I'm glad to be a socket. I'm glad I'm like, I'm like David. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. That, that, and the doorkeepers on the outside. The doorkeeper don't get to do nothing great. They just watch the door. He said, but I'd rather be part of God's kingdom on the outside than living with the devil on the inside. Can I keep talking? We're preaching. A little both, I guess. So we got to look at this, that the sockets were on the bottom. They have all this up. Now, so you got to see it now. All, all, the, all the sockets are set. All the brazen pillars are set. And so now here they go to create the walls of it. The walls are not like uh, wood and stone, but they are the hangings. And we'll talk about those in a minute. So I, I want to I flip here. Can, can we keep talking? I, uh, I've got a little bit more to teach if we can. Are you good? All right. So we have what we call the hooks and the fillets, or what we would call uh, the rods. Somebody say the rods. The hooks and the rods, or the, 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 the scripture calls them the, the, the fillets, if you want to call it that. Uh, the hooks are what held up the curtains, and, and the fillets were the curtain rods. And this is what I want to go to the book of Exodus, because I, I want you to see something here. When God told them to make this, what he's doing. Now, I'm very, uh, paying, I pay very close attention to detail, okay? So I want us to look at 30 and, and verse 12, okay? Exodus 30, verse 12. And this is what the word of the Lord says. And when, when thou takest the sum of the children of the Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them. Okay? This they, they shall give every one that passes among them that are numbered half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is 20 garars. A half shekel shall be of the offering of the Lord. Every one that passes among them that are numbered from 20 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. Mm, ooh, I preach that not there. And they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shalt appoint it to the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. All right, can we keep talking here? 
All right, can we? Can, can, are you ready to, to get what this? This this was this half shekel was of silver, and this silver was to pay for the atonement of sin. Okay, there was a price that had to be paid for sin. Everybody had to bring the same amount. Okay, didn't matter what your economic status was. This is what God told them. Now it was made of silver. Somebody say silver. So silver is what paid for the atonement. Or, or for the covering of sin. Can we keep dealing with this? All right, so silver represents redemption. Why? Go to Matthew's gospel. Now, now you've got to see this. Now, the reason I'm talking about silver because this is what, this is what the, uh, the, the fillets were made of. Uh, the hooks and the fillets were made of silver, okay? They were made of silver. The same material that you paid for for your sin is what these hooks and the rods, the curtain rods, were made of. And there is a reason. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Yee. Where you going, Pastor? I know where I'm going. Don't just keep following me, all right? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. The Word of the Lord says this in verse number 1. They came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings. He said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people into the, into the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, Chia and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtly and kill him. But they said no. They said, said not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. But now, but now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box. Am I reading the right stuff? Yeah, okay, I'm making sure I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Can I keep going? Out of the a precious ointment and poured it up on his head, and he sat at me. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, let's see. When Jesus understood it, he said to them, Why trouble you this woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. So this woman here, she brings, somebody say she brings, she brings a, a, an offering and gives it to uh, Jesus, preparing him for his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, let's go over to the 27th chapter. When the morning was come, and all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death, when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of uh huh. To the chief priests and elders. So Jesus was sold for thirty pieces of silver. After the woman with the alabaster box anointed him, got him ready for his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, Jesus was sold by, by Judas for thirty pieces of silver. What was the offering for sacrifice in Exodus? So Jesus is becoming the atonement. Uh, so when they made these hooks and seal and the curtain rods, this is what it would happen. All right, can I keep talking? When the uh, uh, and these are our scriptures here. I'll leave them up there. When the brazen pillars, after they were put up with the rods of silver, which what what happened was they would form little crosses all around the tabernacle. So when th think about the pillar being up, standing straight up, and then a silver rod going through the the hooks that held the rods. The hooks and the rods were made of silver and the, and the, the brazen pillar was there. So you, when you walked in, if you was to look at each pillar, you would see a cross. All right, can we keep going? At this place is where brass and silver met. The cross is where my sin. Remember we talked about what brass represents? Brass is tainted gold. Remember uh, two weeks ago we had to establish that when you see something was made of brass, it represented sin. Remember that when Moses made the brazen serpent, put it up on the, on the pole, and all that looked at it was okay, representing Christ that would take his sin upon us and that we would live. So when we see brass, the brazen pillars, we see, we see what we would consider sin because Christ took our sin upon us. He took up on sinful flesh and came amongst us. All right? And so this is what happens. And so the cross is where my sin and his redemption collide. Silver. Crossing with brass. His blood crossing with my sin. His payment for my sin. Uh, 
no, hold on, Pastor. Don't get ta taught up yet. Go, go, to, go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter. I'm going to show you something. And we'll, we'll try to quit here in just a minute. It's 810. Can I keep talking? I don't want to give you no more than what you want. Chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Look here. Uh -huh. So it wasn't the silver that redeemed you. It was a representation. When, when Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, it was a representation. But that's not what redeemed you. Look what here. From your vain conversation received ye by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Ah. His blood on the cross is what redeemed me. So when they would walk into the tabernacle to make their sacrifice at the brazen altar, if they was to look up, they would see crosses of brazen and silver. They would, if they would have known at that moment that there would be a day, Shanda Bahia, that they wouldn't have to come. Woo, I feel God. And offer up sacrifice for sin. See, when we come here and praise God, we're not praising God because of our sin. Our praise is not a substitute for our sin. When we come here and praise God, praising Him is just about him. In that day when they brought sacrifice, it was for their sin. They could not come in and just enjoy the presence of God. They had to come in and deal with their sin. But now we are blessed to live in a day to where we don't have to come into church and worry about our sin because it's already been paid for on Calvary. When we come in here, we're going to come in and see we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy. So we bring the sacrifice. Let me tell you tonight, when you come in here, you shouldn't have to worry about your sin. You ought to say, my God, it's already been nailed to the cross. His blood has already paid the price, so I don't have to walk around under the condemnation of sin, but I can walk in the liberation of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right, so give somebody a high five and say, you don't have to be condemned. Romans 8, chapter 1, uh, 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 excuse me, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible Paul says, for there is therefore now no condemnation. There is conviction, but there's not condemnation. When you sin, you ought to feel wrong. Right? But you should not let what you did dictate the rest of your life. You ought to get it under the blood and say, devil, yeah, I made a mistake, but it's under the blood. I have an advocate with the Father. It's under, my God, I'm trying not to preach it here. Yeah. Somebody's walking out of here tonight and say, that was my past. I did do that, but I have a future. I have a hope. I have my oh God, and there's something inside of me that's keeping me and holding me. It is the cross. It is what happened on the old rugged cross. I'm so glad tonight. I'm so glad tonight for the cross of Calvary that's liberated me. Can you say yes? Yeah. Glory to God. Tell somebody say I've been liberated. This is where my sin, the cross, rest yourself. This is where my sin collides with his redemption. I'm doing... I'm not doing too good of a job teaching this, am I? No. Yeah. It is where my sin collides. So when you would see the brazen altar and you'd see the cross, you would see... Now, uh, whoo, can, I, can I talk to you for a minute? When you see a cross, you see a colliding point of two places. So I'm, I'm going to make a cross. My arms represent uh, the, the, the silver, the rods, and my, my torso, my body. Let me get over here represent uh, the brazen altar. Now look, there's direction here. North, south, east, west. So somebody says, how far does God love go? Far as the east is, which is a circle. <laughs> which is... Uh, <laughs> 
So, 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 so if you was to put a cross on planet earth, if you was to start drawing a line and go back over, it would go from north to south. And then if you start drawing a line from east to west, guess what? Let me tell you, it reaches everywhere. It reaches every man. It reaches every woman. It reaches every kindred. It reaches every nation. The African, the Chinaman, I feel like having church and Shakata behind you. It doesn't matter where you're at. I'm glad that the cross reaches. I'm glad that the blood is flowed for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. I'm glad the cross is where my sin collided with the redemption power of the blood of Jesus. When you say amen. Yeah, all right. Let me, let me finish with this. Can I finish with this? Okay. So we, see, we, got, we, so we got to see the purpose of the pillars what they did with the with the curtain rods and the hooks that would hold the fine twine linen. There was two reasons here. For, for, the first reason is for the support of the hangings of the curtain of the court and to support the gate into the tabernacle. Those are the two main reasons. For support of the hangings of the curtains of the court. And I just put up pictures of modern day pillars. It's hard to find uh, pictures of true tabernacle pillars. But I did my best to get some examples earlier in our PowerPoint uh, of the teachings a few uh, I believe it was last Wednesday. And so I just put up here pictures just kind of show you support. So for the hangings of the, cur of the curtains of the court and to support the gate uh, into the tabernacle. All right? We should be the, a support system that will take the weight of his glory and help provide a way for others to get in. It was the hangings of the curtains. The curtains. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and his train. That word train also means curtain. It filled the temple for the madness. You've got to look at this. This is what the pillars did. It held the weight of the glory of God, but it also held the gate that it was into the tabernacle. You should be a, a weight. You should be holding the weight of the glory of God and at the same time holding the entrance into the power and the anointing of God. This is what your purpose is to do, is to hang there and say, "There's a ga I'm not the pillar you can not enter in by the pillar. A pillar there is no way you can walk through the pillar. But what the pillars would do was hold the way for the gate. And that's what we got to tell people. We're not the way but we're holding the way. Oh my God I'm out here. We're not the truth but we're holding the truth. We're not the life but we're holding the life. You can't get to the Father except you go by Jesus. And I'm just holding up Jesus. When you see me I'm just holding up Jesus. When I preach I'm just holding up Jesus. Jesus. When I teach, I'm just holding up Jesus as I want to show you that there is a way into the presence of God. I'm going to finish with this. Go to 2 Corinthians 3. And I will, I'll be done because I don't want to overfeed you. Woo! Mm. Well, Lord, I'm glad there ain't nobody on the piano tonight. I'd preach all night long. 2 Corinthians 3. This helps us show us our purpose for the pillars to hold the weight of His glory and to provide a way for others to get in. Verse 3. Do we begin again to commend am I right? Am I reading? For, I'm in 2 I'm I'm Corinthians. Let me go to no I'm in 2 Corinthians 3. I'm looking at new notes in the future. 2 Corinthians 3 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some other epistles of com commendation to you or letters of commendation to you from you? He, he said, so he wants to start out and say, do, do we need to send you thank you for doing your job letter? Hello? Am I teaching too long or is you all ready to go? Like you tired now? Do I need to, do I need, let me put it to you like this. Um, Alexis is here, and before we left, I was sitting at the kitchen table, got my stuff together, come over here tonight, um, going to pray for Brother Steve's mother who was in the hospital, so we left a little bit early. And uh, Alexis walks out of her room, comes into the, to the, uh, um, the kitchen, opens up the, uh, uh, the refrigerator, and gets her something to drink. You know something I did not do to her? I did not do to her what I, what I did to her when she was first learning to walk. When she was first learning to walk, 
I mean, like, when she first said, oh, yes, we would give her a cheer. Right? Ain't that what you do? Oh, come on, take that first step. And you give them uh, a confirmation. I seen Roxanne doing that to Scooter. That's Noella. That, but Scooter's her name because that's all she did for all the time. She could scoot faster than you could walk. <laughs> I mean, she'd be gone. That's why I call her. She'll all, never get rid of me. As long as I live, she'll be called Scooter. That's her nickname from past. And, uh, and, 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 but I, I remember, like, you know, Roxanne would get frustrated. Dan would get frustrated. Cause but every time that she'd go to try to walk her, and I remember Alexis and Josiah, you know, we would be happy. Oh, you walk. Great. And so the more they walked in there for a few months, we got excited. You know, they would walk a long time. I'll never forget in the home that we live in when Alexis walked from uh, right there at the edge of the kitchen all the way to the couch that was in our living room. And it was a, it was a great compliment, uh, accomplishment to her. And I was excited because she being my oldest, that's the first time I'd ever seen that. You know, w watching a kid just develop and walk and, and get that underneath her. Her. But today, when she walked in there, I didn't go, you walked today. Good job. Good job, Alexis. I never, ever since that moment, I never got happy about her, you know, walking. And so for somebody that's been in church for a while, the pastor or nobody else shouldn't have to say, great job giving you tithes today. Oh man, that's, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're being faithful in giving your tithes. Now to somebody that just got saved, that's something that's appropriate. You show them how to give their 10% and you help them. But for somebody that's been saved for a while, we shouldn't have to say, good job. For somebody that's been in this for a while, we shouldn't have to say, my God, you praised him good tonight. You should be praising him good every night. And I should have to give you a compliment and a pat on the back to say, good job. Oh, I know this is tough teaching, but this is going to make us who we need to be in God. Can someone say amen? Because when you get certain things done, we shouldn't have to always waste our time. That's waste, that'd be wasting time for me to take time from looking at my Bible to tell Alexa she did a good job walking from her room into the kitchen to get something to drink. What sense does that make? None. And so we want the pastor, after we've been in this for a while, to always give us attention when babes that have just come in and got saved need the attention. But we're so upset because why am I dealing with this tonight? Lord Jesus, let me, let me go home. I was doing good. Y'all were running all over the building. Now you're about to stone me in the same service. But it's the truth. We shouldn't have to write you a letter and say, oh great job, do that. There comes a moment where you know this is my job. This is what I do. And if nobody ever thanks me, I'm going to continue to do my job. If nobody says great job, I'm going to continue to do my job. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. Let me read. Ye are an epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much uh, uh, as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in the tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. You're a pillar. They ought to see Christ in you. The hope of glory. They ought to see you holding up. Jesus Christ. And somebody shouldn't have to confirm for you to do that every time you leave here. Come on, somebody. Help me out. we got to hold the weight of His glory. And I talked about last, last Wednesday that a pillar, is, when it's correctly up and it's doing its job, it is a great support. It is great to have. But when a pillar gets out of place, something that is, support, is, that is a support becomes a burden. What are you doing? Are you being a support? Or are you being a burden? Are you worshiping God when everybody else is worshiping God? Or are you just sitting there waiting for somebody else to do it? I'm going to watch Brother Tim tonight. You know what? That's being a burden. That's not being a support. Woo! Glory to God. Oh, I'll pick what night to go to revival. I ain't going to go every night. Oh, that's next week, by the way. You being a support or you being a burden? You picking and choosing or you going to come bear, bear the load with everybody? Carry the weight of the glory of God for everybody. Because when one pillar starts to fall, it starts weakening another one. And then it starts to fall. And it's, you either going to help somebody hold somebody up or you're going to help pull somebody down. And the choice is up to you. I've seen... Um, I'm going to try to say this delicately because we're on Facebook and so I don't want no one to assume anything. But I, I, let's just put it this way. I've been in churches where there was great preachers, great pastor, great pastor preach like nobody's business. 
Good music. But there was nothing in there. It was dead. You would look around and you would hear the man of God preaching and you'd be like, what are y'all doing? You know what they were doing? They were being a burden. They were not supporting. Jesus, help me today. We're not going to be that here, not as long as I'm pastoring. I'm not going to bear the weight. I'm not going to get up here and be your little puppet on a string and preach real great and you sit there and not do nothing. It's not happening. Tell somebody, say, it's not happening. We got to carry the weight. You got to do your job. You got to be, your, you, you, you could be that pillar. You could be that socket. You can be that, 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 uh, the, 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 the hooks of silver or the brazen rod you can be you can do your part think about it when the rod the curtain rod was made of silver is beautiful when you would go up you would see it but when you would slide the fine twine linen over it would you see it would you see the hooks that was holding it up no it was hidden it was covered and sometimes God has to hide you and sometimes you got to be willing to do a work when nobody else sees it You've got to be willing to pray when nobody else sees it. You've got to be willing to fast when nobody else sees it. You've got to be willing to clean the church when nobody else sees it. You've got to be willing to clean up the parking lot when nobody else sees it. Because if you always got to be seen, guess what? You, you probably ain't got a spot just yet. God's working on you still. Yes. Can someone say amen? You've got, to find, you've got to find yourself. You've got to find that place where you need to be. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to quit. Grab somebody by the hand. Went a little lengthy. But the teaching was good tonight. Y'all were ready. And that's how I like teaching. Amen. When you all are ready. Not when y'all are dead, but y'all are actively ready. Father God, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you tonight, God, for what you're saying to us. I thank you, Lord God, you're talking to us, Lord, in minute detail. What most people would overlook, God, you have given us a clear revelation uh, about what you are wanting to say and what you're wanting to do in this church and our life and in the body of Christ as a whole. God, help us when we get ready to walk up out of this place, to walk out of here in the power of the revelation of your word, to walk out of here in demonstration of your spirit, and to hold up the glory, to hold up the, the entryway, God, to be who you've called us to be, God, to find that part and, and effectively work it, God. Let everybody in this place know, and God, help us as we continue to grow as a church, and no matter how many members you give us, no matter how many people you give us, we are many members, yet one body. We're still working together. We have one goal. We have one vision. We have one, we have one destination, and we're all working in that together, Lord. And God, no matter what anybody else in here is doing, God, let them know that the part they have to play is crucial, Lord. If it's a prayer warrior, Lord, if it's a greeter, God, whatever they need to do, whatever they need to be, God, let them find themselves doing it God let them find themselves fitting into the tabernacle into the place into the body that you've called them to be not where they want to be not where they're pleased to be but where you are pleased with them, where they're at God that's where I want to be I want to be pleased God when you are pleased with me I'm happy God when you are happy with me God so put me and have me to say and do what you want me to do and I'll give you the glory and give you the praise and give you the honor and hold up the tabernacle so your glory will fall amongst your people in Jesus name if you believe it clap your hands and give God Glory. Come on, give him a great praise. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Look at someone say ouch. I don't know some of that hurt, and I ain't going to look at you, but some of that hurt you. You're like, whoo. Pastor's a little rough around the edges tonight. Glory to God. Glory to God. Tonight I want to come to you for our Wednesday night offering. Amen. So I want you to go ahead and get your, your tithe ready. Amen. Get your offering ready. Amen. To sow into the ministry and the work of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. 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 Josiah. The offering plate, please. But Tim, pray over offering tonight. Amen. Something wrong with you? That's the quietest prayer I've ever heard you pray in your life. My God, when he uses it, my we glory to God. That's what he does when he first gets up. I thought, my God, something wrong with Tim? He praying quiet over everybody can hear him. Hallelujah. Amen. Let God bless you and give him. Somebody say, I have, because I give. Say, I give, because I have. One more time, say, I have, because I give, and I give. Because I have. 
if you're watching us by Facebook tonight, feel free to go up and support our ministry uh, with a, a donation, with a gift. We have a, a donate button through PayPal. Everything is secure. Uh, you can, if you want to go to PayPal and, and put in the Greater Remnant Church at gmail.com, you can do that as well and, uh, and support us. We love providing these services and messages to you and teachings to you. So if they've been a blessing to you, uh, and you've been faithfully watching and getting something from it, please support us. Can someone say amen? We need it so we can provide these services to you. Glory to God. Give Jesus a great big hand clap of praise. <laughs>